Hello and welcome to this important discussion and webinar. My name is Freddie Mashate and I am the current manager of Southwest Africa. I really thought I should take up this time to come out and say hi, but also to just give you a bit of an update on what we are busy with here at, at Southwest Africa. Now, when COVID-19 hit us in March, Southwest Africa was about 21 days away from the physical festival. Um, and although much of the planning had gone into the physical festival, we were really faced with the real question of how would we con continue to connect and engage with you, our valuable supporters. We also knew that as the National Science Festival, we had an obligation to continue celebrating science and creating platforms where our contributors could continue to really add on to this mission of ours of creating a science literate society. This platform was then created really as an effort to continue celebrating science, but beyond this as a platform where we would uh, be able to um, uh, use it as a focal point within SciFest where we could you know, have important and robust discussions such as the ones that we're going to be having today. Under the banner of the road to digital, we have received enormous support from our contributing partners and you, the people that come and participate in whatever activities that we do. Uh, apart from the webinars, we also have uh, partnered or collaborated rather with Steam Forward and Dr. Janita Pritchett from the US, uh, who is a longtime friend of Cyfest Africa. And what we have done is we have come up with a six week program of digital science demonstrations. These have been well received by parents and learners who are mostly at home with, with, with nothing really to do and that is educational and, and interesting. Um, if you have missed any of our previous sessions, you are in luck, you can go on to our Facebook page where we live stream all our sessions, but also onto our YouTube uh, channel where we then post these sessions after, after, uh, afterwards. May I also take the opportunity to ask all of you to like, share, and follow our social media handles. What we have found out is that as COVID-19, you know, uh, continues to, to, to really trouble us, social media has, uh, can be used as a pivotal tool, uh, as an important tool to, to communicate. And we're trying to build on social media so that we can have a good, you know, uh, communicate, communicating space on, on social media. Uh, the SciFest Africa team, uh, if I can just update you on that, continues to work from home with a few administrative uh, functions that are being held in the office. Should you have ideas that you wish to pass, pass on to us or should you have uh, any contribution that might amplify our current efforts, please do not hesitate to get in contact with us on our telephonic line, office telephonic line, which is 046. 6031155 or email us at info at cyphers.org.za info i n f o at cyphers.org.za let me not waste uh, much time let me really hand you over to Stephen Lang who is today going to be introducing the topic and our esteemed uh, panel but before I do so, please allow me to just thank Prof. Janice Limson, who is the vice chairperson of our advisory committee. She has played a fundamental role, especially in curating this discussion that we're going to be having today and putting together the panel. Should you have questions, uh, and if you're on Facebook, please make use of the comment section. And if you're on the Zoom platform, please make use of the Q&A function, we will be monitoring those and pushing all questions, all comments to, to Stephen. Really, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. And over to you, Stephen. Thank you, Freddie. Good afternoon to everyone. My name is Stephen Lang, as Freddie mentioned, and I'll be your host for this afternoon's discussion on surviving the storm, science and science media in the time of COVID-19. Roles, challenges, opportunities, and looking ahead. When the COVID-19 pandemic brought most of the world to a standstill, scientists from multiple fields rapidly mobilized to conduct crucial research into this virus, 
resulting in the unparalleled pace of research into developing vaccines, treatments, and diagnostics. Step by step, science communicators and journalists match pace with scientists to communicate and disseminate research findings, struggling against shifting perspectives, fake news, policies, and narratives as new information came to light each day. We are still in the middle of this storm in South Africa, but it is not yet too soon to reflect on the essential role that South African scientists and South African media practitioners and communicators are playing, both separately and in partnership with each other in the country's ability to deal with the pandemic. SciFest Africa, in collaboration with the Department of Science and Innovation and the NRF Saatchi Chair in Biotechnology, Innovation and Engagement at Rose University, is pleased to welcome today Professor Himla Sujol of the Academy of Science of South Africa, Mandy Smallhorn, President of SASJA, the South African Science Journalists Association, and Dr. Beverly Damans, Group Executive Science Engagement and Corporate Relations at the National Research Foundation, as they reflect on the role and value of science and science media in this time of COVID-19. So let's start with our first question, and let me ask each of our panelists to briefly explain what your organization represents within the South African science and science communication space. Let's start with you, Professor Sujo. Well, good evening, Stephen, and good evening, colleagues uh, listening online. Uh, firstly, let me congratulate the SciFest team for putting together this awesome opportunity for us to have an engagement despite all the challenges we are facing in the country. I think it is, it is incredible that uh, we can share our insights on uh, the topic at hand. Uh, so coming to the question you raised, uh, at ASAF, or the Academy of Science of South Africa, um, we are in the business of using evidence-based science in the service of society. We are a membership-based organization, and I'm sure all of you have been watching the sterling work our forefront uh, scientists, uh, despite their sub-discipline, are playing and providing a voice um, behind uh, issues associated with the COVID pandemic. So with respect to science communication, basically everything we do is based on how we engage at multiple stakeholder levels to access information, how we package that and target the dissemination thereof to the various stakeholder partners. So I think ASAF is in a reasonable position to punt from the top in terms of contributing from an evidence-based approach uh, towards the dissemination of information across, across the bandwidth of the varied stakeholders we have. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Damonzi, uh, can you tell us about your position at the NRF? Um, the NRF um, is the premier science organization that um, at this time finds itself in the eye of the storm we, when we consider this particular topic and that of science and science media. Since our core remains to generate this defensible knowledge through the research, uh, researchers and scientists that we support mainly in higher education, but also science councils and national laboratories and national facilities throughout the country. But we have also a real commitment to building, to strengthening the relationship between uh, science and society through engagement with this research. And I really think that what you've seen uh, to a large extent in terms of the public face of the uh, pandemic and its communication has been around the, uh, the defensible knowledge base presented by the science community, uh, as, Dr., as Professor Sudial has uh, intimated, but you've also then seen that you've had the public reaction, uh, both positive and negative, to this area. And so um, I think this uh, conversation comes at a very opportune time for us we are definitely not at the end of the pandemic. I don't think we can draw any 
fast and hard uh, rules or fast and hard conclusions when it comes to the communication as yet. But I think this is an interesting space at this particular time at the confluence between, between science and its engagement with society right now. Thank you. And now for um, Mandy Smallhorn of South African Science Journalists Association. And for those of you who are worried about, you can't see a picture of Mandy, don't worry. It's, uh, there's a problem is with her computer, not with yours. So uh, over to you, Mandy. Yeah, I'm not the ghost in the machine. <laughs> I'm president of the South African Science Journalists Association. It's a very small group of people, as you can imagine. Um, but there are some very uh, uh, skilled and experienced science journalists represented in that group. It is a group uh, mandated to advance and promote science journalism in South Africa and provides a community of science journalists um, with very active WhatsApp group that shares information people who can be asked questions, who can, we can bounce things off each other, look for sources, that kind of thing. Um, we are, a, a number of our members have been very active in training science journalists, um, providing training for general journalists who want a little bit of um, uh, an idea of how to report science and how to understand science, and in mentoring young uh, journalists. Um, I also represent the World Federation of Science Journalists, so I have a little bit of an idea of what's going on in the rest of the world. You have a, a wider viewpoint. Okay, thank you. Now we've all introduced the panelists. Let's get to some of the trickier questions. We can see what's really happening here. And I, I'll, I'll direct the first question to uh, Dr. Damons. And the, the question is, in terms of science communication, was South Africa prepared for the challenge of communicating coronavirus to the public? Were we agile enough to respond to the challenge? Um, I don't like yes and no answers, but I think I'm going to use it right <laughs> at this particular time. <laughs> well, you have to explain that. Yeah. Because really, uh, the answer to that is yes and no, depending on a number of factors that we need to take into account. I mean, the question is, um, were we prepared for the challenge of communicating this? I'm not so sure that we, the world saw this coming. Uh, and then, so from that point of view, we were playing catch up on most fronts, uh, both on the science, the disease, the mitigation, the prevention, and still right now, vaccine, et cetera, et cetera. So, so we're, we're, we're responding in, in that line. Um, I think from a South African perspective, if you think of public health communication, South Africa has had a very strong public health communication skills base for a very long time. We can think right back to the um, activities, the ways of working of communicating, all related to the HIV uh, AIDS pandemic. And so we had a base, a, a very strong, almost activist base of um, communication. And I see health, health science communication as a part of the broader science communication uh, efforts uh, in the country. So I think we had a base from which to work. Um, I think that we also saw coming to the front a large, uh, well, maybe not large, but a, a really good number of scientists uh, coming to the fore to, to raise the voice of science, uh, as it were. And from that point of view, you, you be, we were more able to, to get the scientific message out of there. I think there have been quite quick adaptations to online and digital spaces. This being an example, but very early on, you saw the shift. And you also saw the power of television uh, in communication in a space where as a country, you hardly saw the, the power of the science communication apart from events. Uh, here we had the science, we had the scientists and in some sense, the science linked to the political, which uh, served purposes in, one, in some spaces and then mitigated against trust in other spaces. 
So I think in the beginning, there were uh, early signs that there was some, some progress uh, that the communication aspects were able to quickly move and adapt. In our own organization, we found that we very quickly uh, worked with, uh, through Mandy and uh, other people, worked with uh, community media. Uh, and community media which remain close to the people on the ground and especially in relaying messages in the language of the people within the community. Um, and we found that that also was an agile response to the training of uh, intern science journalists and getting them to, to really look at the pandemic as an opportunity to, to grow the science communication base. But on the other hand, I cannot say that we have been probably as agile as we needed to be, or, or even have, have we explored all the different ways of networking organizations and science uh, communication capability across the whole country. Mandy says that she has a small organization, but I think, um, are we able to access that expertise and network across the capability that relies in organize, that lies in organizations that we don't even know about currently, but probably have capability that could be used to the advantage of uh, engagement with public audiences? Have we um, been able to use technologies outside of the traditional communication space? I'm not so sure we've used all the, the technologies, all the networks outside of that space. And I'm also not too sure that we've actually um, been, been um, really able to change. Uh, be, we haven't measured whether we've been able, in this case, through our responses, been able to measure changes. So I think, yes, we have used what opportunities there are available. I think we've explored some, but I think there remain others for us still to explore going into the future, whether uh, we remain under these limited lockdown conditions. Or yes. not. So my, my understanding is that you say the scientists were agile to a degree, but could have done better. Let me put it to, to Mandy now, whether she believes that journalists were agile enough in conveying this message. Uh, Stephen, I think that journalists tried hard. I think that the obstacle to being agile enough was what's happening on the media landscape generally. That we've had science beats closed down wholesale. That we've had health closed down wholesale. We were lucky in that this country has two very powerful reporting organizations, Becca and Health E, that um, were ready and able to interrogate the science and, and deal with what was coming down the pike. But a lot of the reporting on this um, uh, pandemic was happening in general newsrooms. And it was generalist journalists who were being pivoted to deal with the pandemic. And I'm not sure that there was enough mentoring, assistance, help, oversight uh, to, uh, I feel very sorry for somebody who's just pointed in this direction and said, go, go report on this. With a lot of obstacles, by the way, lockdown itself being an obstacle, journalists were allowed to be moving around, but how frightened were you? I, I'd like some people to comment on that. How frightened were you in the beginning about being exposed out there? How frightened were you about the feeling of threat from the police and the SANDF? That was there and it was real. How problematic was the fact that you were doing so much of your work using data? You know, that's costly and journalists are notoriously sure. not earning well. Um, how, Physical how, impediments there. Yeah, yeah, PPE for instance, for journalists. Was that provided adequately? I'm not talking about your major uh, media organizations. I'm talking about community newspapers, for instance, uh, community radio stations, uh, the smaller outlets around the country. Um, so there was a 
probably a lack of, um, for, for many people, a lack of understanding of the kind of scientific jargon, uh, and terminology and ideas, you know, statistical ideas, for instance, that were out there. Um, I think that in, in, in the positive sense, we had a good deal of, of, of cooperation and collaboration with scientists. I must say that scientists have made themselves enormously available, at least in my experience. Um, other people may have comments about that. Another thing that was, um, was a, a problematic was that if you did take an interest in the science, there was so, so much. All those preprints. Uh, how do you, as somebody who is, in inverted commas, just a journalist, assess and understand what's going on in the science? I have been writing about health for over 20 years now, and I have never in all that time seen anything like it. It is like, I mean, in one sense, it's tremendous exciting because I was physically watching science happen on the go. I was watching researchers talking on Twitter in long threads to clinicians and, and feeding information backwards and forwards between each other. And then two weeks later, a preprint would appear that reflected some of the ideas that you'd seen on Twitter. So it was tremendously exciting. But at the same time, I was very aware that if I had been me 20 years ago trying to negotiate the terrain, I would have been confused very confused and there wasn't much to help you negotiate that. The other so thing think, of course... I, th I think uh, Mandy what you're saying is there are there are uh, physical in the, um, impediments to covering whatever is happening in COVID-19 but at the same time there are also tremendous advantages that as you said we wouldn't have had 20 years ago. We can we can mine Twitter, we can mine a lot mm. of the social media to, to find out what is actually happening. Yes, and I think that the, um, the, the availability of scientists has been facilitated by that as well. In the old days, much easier. you have to you know, ask for permission to speak to a scientist, and now you can just send him something on Twitter. You know. It's very easy. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to put the next question to Professor Sujo. Uh, science is arguably front and center of this pandemic. South African scientists, many of them members of your organization, ASAF, have played important roles in communication during this pandemic. Is it subtly different from how scientists viewed science communication pre-pandemic? Is there a different mindset to engaging with the public? Yeah, I know that's quite an interesting take on looking at the value of science communication. Let's, let's refocus our minds and, and realize that, you know, that word we've heard so many times, unprecedented. Initially, I had to check out the meaning of it when I started hearing it. And I heard it so many times that I actually had to engage with it. Uh, and, and so we had to pull up, you know, from the cupboard our punchlines to get the messages across. Uh, Beverly mentioned earlier the value of science and the, the, the truth of science in communication. And, and you may recall, we had a very epic moment. It was about the middle of April when Slim Abdul Karim, uh, together with the Minister of Health, addressed the country. It was epic. He took, he took the jargon out of science. He used hardcore data. He presented us with graphs with statistics, with published peer-reviewed information to bring out the scientific value in communication of what was going on. And he's the sort of person, if he gets asked a question and he doesn't know the answer, he'd say, I don't know on this. You know, that honesty came across. And I think that was a, a kind of uh, very epic moment in the value of being able to package information Mandy just said, you know, she's been reporting for 20 years on science and the health of, uh, in the health sector. But suddenly, we we confronted with a novel virus. But as Bev also mentioned earlier, it's not as if we haven't dealt with 
activism in, in, in science previously. The AIDS pandemic gave us a rush and opportunities of, uh, of taking on uh, the political views of the country and championing the ethos of science and the evidence of science to put forward ideas to eventually bring us to where we are with respect to the AIDS pandemic. With this particular case, the story broke on the 31st of December, when most of us were planning our New Year's Eve parties, etc. Originally, we, we were mostly akin with information from international media, what was going on in China and what was going on globally. We heard the voice from the WHO, who's you know the powerhouse that briefs us with respect to health issues. And then eventually, on the 5th of March, when our first case was reported in this country, we watched the numbers grow in its uh, you know, singular, then into its tens, and look at where we stand today. We have also gone through a, a, a kind of uh, trust with our politicians in the initial phase, and we're waxing and waning at the moment because of mixed messages because of legislation issues that are now being taken you know to courts etc so that whole landscape has definitely influenced the way in which we communicate and the way in which we engage with what is out there either in social media print media or on television so so we we are in that learning phase and so pre the COVID pandemic, we relied very much on, I'm talking about ASA, for example, our workshops, our conferences, our launches of uh, our consensus study documents, et cetera. But now we had to very quickly um, bootstrap the situation. We now have webinars. So we basically doing what we were doing, if not more, using the tools that are now available to us. And in addition to communicating uh, via just ASAF, we also have the Young Academy of Science, SIAS. And they have been brilliant at, at, at moving that energy of getting the message across to the younger you know, researchers as well. And then we have our Quest magazine that targets uh, uh, younger scholars from you know grades ten and upwards. So so Quest has been carrying uh, in its magazine format information on the virus, targeted at that particular audience. Our journal, the South African Journal of Science, just in its last issue, has put out about a dozen articles from you know experts in the field of the socio-economic uh, landscape and humanities to kind of uh, get some equilibrium to the sort of uh, perception that health science is overrepresented in the media and that we are dealing with a social problem. And so, so these scholars have added their voice. The ASAP website has been populating information and the social media are carrying mm -hmm. stories of our eminent scientists as they publish things. So, so, so we've had to resort to different means of getting information across. The question is, how well is it uh, being articulated in this landscape? You know, it's too early to tell, but if I were to, to tell you that in the first quarter of this year, uh, as we did our quarterly report, ASAF has generated something like 23 million rand of revenue just from publicity. And, and our outreach has been over three and a half million people. So, so only about 4% of that media was kind of negative. So obviously, whatever we've been doing has had a little bit of that impetus, that kind of gravitational pull to be able to show relevance in a very rapid and challenging environment. So, so it's, it's early days and we need to see how this plays out, but definitely for us at ASAF, there have been lots of positives in terms of the numbers and numbers are the truth, right? Yes.
Sometimes it's, it's like a, a bit of a horse race with all the numbers going on all the time. Um, <laughs> you, you said that you described um, the epic moment when Professor Abdul Karim uh, spoke and addressed the media, addressed the country. Uh, and, and you described it as an epic moment, and I agree with you, it was an epic moment. Why did that epic moment not continue? Um, it would be really in, instructive to see that. I think we've been playing damage control. If you look at how things unfolded thereafter, look, I mean, uh, Prof Karim, his wife Karisha, and many, many others like Glenda Gray, Sabir Mahdi, Helen Reese, Jonathan Janssen, Priscilla Reddy, Imran Valodia, Crane Sudin, Dorit Pozel. I mean, these are just a few names that are coming to yes. mind who are ASAF members who have been penetrating the media, bringing together their discipline and what they have been doing in the fight against the pandemic. So this is multidisciplinary. And, and so you have the science uh, bandwidth on the one hand, and then you have this negative publicity that's growing in the face of adversity as we look at it. I mean, you know, corruption issues, the misappropriation of funds, uh, the, 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 the strive to get uh, PPE across to people, the, the, the scenarios in our hospitals. Uh, so, so together with the good, there's been the ugly. And unfortunately, as we all know, you can have a hundred good and one bad, it is a bad that will get the majority of the publicity because that's the way our society and our culture is, you know, uh, built on. So, so we, have to, we have to work past those issues. We've got to renew the trust. We've got to, to rebuild a space where the voice of, of every single individual is there together with science. We should have open debates. We should listen to each other because it's only from this sort of uh, mutual respect and connectivity will we be able to walk that walk in a way of achieving the, the ultimate objectives of it all. Okay, great. I'm going to throw out a, a general question now for the panel um, so anyone can answer. Whose responsibility is it to ensure that proper factual communication is disseminated? The science communicator, the scientist, the journalist, or government? Maybe you'd each like to comment on that. Um, Steve, I guess you mentioned a whole chain of um, people responsible for the uh, eventual message and just as in the chain, you, you cannot ascribe uh, the strength or the weakness to any one particular part and say it is your responsibility. There are just so many of our scientists who would say to me, um, actually, I'd rather not talk to a journalist because my information would be, um, you know, it would be sacrilege. You know, if they get it wrong exactly how, you know, some of the things that Mandy has been talking about. Uh, it's too complex. And, and um, saying things like, well, I give you the right information. And it, it definitely is. We have to be sure of the source of the information. Um, there's a whole thing that we haven't raised yet in this conversation that has added to the negativity is the issue of fake news, you know? And, and so the credible source of the information we always trust will come from the scientists. We have instances internationally where that hasn't been the case, where the source, the, the trusted source hasn't, um, our trust has been misplaced. But generally, uh, in most cases, the uh, information, the science information coming from the scientists is taken to be the trusted source. But it's possible in the communication of that information that there is a misinterpretation or somebody gets it wrong, but it really does rely on the scientists to provide 
and the others in the chain to keep checking that the factual information is actually correct. Um, we know in a relationship between journalists and, and anybody, in this case, a scientist, um, the journalist wants to eventually take ownership of that piece without uh, you know, having to continually refer back to the, the scientists. But if we're going to get it right, I think the trust relationship has to be born at that level already. Because if we don't have it, we're going to find along the chain the, 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 the efficacy of the data, the interpretation, the message that gets out in the end um, has to be um, in line with, the, uh, with what the data is telling you. It can't be, um, you know, our interpretation of the data in a way that, that nullifies um, the evidence. And so the responsibility, I think, lies on each person within the chain uh, of events. And we know that things can go wrong. Uh, we really, we've seen it. We've seen it going wrong in different parts of the chain, um, right from the source uh, to the end, based on lots of these factors, training, no space, no, uh, very few, very, very few specialized science journalists, the ability to take complex science information and make it accessible to public uh, audiences in a way that doesn't um, treat the public as a deficit head to be filled with information but still allows that public to be empowered by that information so that we can debate, we can argue, we can um, speak um, from a sense of empowerment as opposed from a sense of um, scientists placed on pedestals, um, as it were. So, so I think the responsibility lies along the chain. And I think it's not just about responsibility, but it's about building the trust along that chain as well. It can be very tricky. And, and, and I'm not surprised that uh, Mandy Smallhorn had her hand up, but now she seems to have gone offline. I don't know if she's disappeared or what happened to her, but um, I'm not surprised that she would want to respond to some of the things that you said. Mm. Um, one of the biggest problems in journalism at the moment is that there is a lack of science journalists. And we've had a situation where a lot of other types of journalists, political journalists, um, general journalists, are suddenly having to do uh, science journalism, and, and they're not really uh, up to doing it. Um, I see Mandy has put on her, she is there, and I think that she can hear us. Can you speak, Mandy? Yes, I just went missing okay. for a second. So you had a question? Um, yeah, we were just talking now about whose responsibility it is yes. to ensure that factual information gets across. Yes, well, of course. Um, I, I was listening to Beverly, and by the way, I, I just want to have to say this thing, Beverly. These science stories are complex, and that is the thing that people just don't realize that matters about science journalism. People who engage in science journalism have, have had some kind of training or years of experience in taking those very complex stories and turning them into something that does not let down the science, that does not tell the wrong story, but that tells a story that people can understand. So sorry, that's for advertising plug for the day. Um, and I wanted to agree with you about fake news. It has been an absolute tsunami and I'm not sure how people who, who don't have um, uh, experience, I mean I, I have had loads and loads of people over the last couple of months approach me on WhatsApp or Facebook or whatever privately and say what's your take on this Mandy, what's your take on that because they can't figure out in some cases how to tell that it's fake news or not, should they be reporting on this. Um, it is an enormous responsibility, and as Beverly said, I don't think that it's the journalists or the media's alone. I think that it's a, a shared responsibility, and we should all be working together on, um, in terms of getting the message across. I don't know if I'm 
going off base here, uh, Stephen, but I was horrified over the last week. I have interviewed two physiotherapists and this is a message that is very clear. People don't, they're coming out of hospital, out of public sector hospitals and not even knowing what it is that they have been ill with. Mm. Now, this is not a problem of I'm not targeting the staff in the public sector hospitals. I think those nurses and allied professionals and doctors are under such enormous pressure at the moment that you can't expect them to be doing that kind of educating. What's worrying me about it is that I know that we have engaged as a country in a communications campaign that is plainly not in some ways and in some areas hitting the mark. The one physicist to me in the last week, I've had one person say to me, yes, I know I've got this thing called COVID-19 and I think I got it in a taxi. Otherwise, they didn't know what it was they, they had. The physiotherapist was spending time educating people. Now, that is an indictment of both our government communication campaigns and of journalism. What are we doing to get this message out there? Is this happening at, for instance, a community radio, uh, uh, in a community radio space? This is where it should be happening. This is where it would be very, very um, um, good for it to happen because those community radio stations, for instance, are talking in one of the 11 languages, not English and Afrikaans, but one of the 11 languages that people need to hear this information in. In terms they understand, not just the language, but the references, the analogies, the metaphors uh, that enable people to understand things. As I said, I think it's a shared responsibility and in some ways I think we stepped up to the mark and in some ways I think we have failed. Uh, Professor Sujo, would you like to comment on that? I would just want to agree with whatever my colleagues yes. have said and, and basically from a science uh, point of view, it is about uh, recognition of peer-reviewed uh, content that we should be citing. Uh, we have heard how many papers have been retracted. Uh, you know that rush, everybody's on the bandwagon to want to publish in this uh, environment, right? And you yes. want to do it in double quick time because you got the story that you want to tell. Unfortunately, uh, proper science takes uh, collecting the data, analyzing the data, interrogating the data, uh, engaging with your collaborators and peers before you rush to publish. And it is that level of publication that we need to seek during this particular time. We also have publications that go un, um, unreviewed. Uh, and, and lots of our friends and colleagues, you know, publish in areas uh, to, to, to air their opinions. And their opinions may not be based on uh, having all the facts at their disposal, but it's a means of getting their voice out there. So there are different types of ways in which we can publish and have that engagement. But I, I have to agree with whatever has been said. And, and of course, we realize that, and we've been talking about this pre-COVID, that uh, science journalism is a very, very specialized uh, skill. It's, it's, it's complex. And if we really want to get your message across, not talking to your peers. And I mean, we've recently had a paper accepted. Uh, one of my science journalist colleagues asked us for comments. My, my previous uh, colleague was a first author. And it's like jargon. And I look at this and I say, what, El how are you gonna deal with this? So, you know, you just massage it to make it personable, to contextualize in simplistic terms. We do not have to blow our trumpets. You've got to get the message packaged in some bite to reach out. And even if you take two or three facts from whatever you, you have concocted from thousands of hours of reading, and you are able to, 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 to communicate that in a way that conveys the, the science and the value of science, you've achieved a lot, lot more 
and punting 200 lines of jargon that only you can understand. So you gotta know your target audience. You gotta, you gotta package information for the target audience. And fortunately for us, some of our colleagues who have been out there speaking have those skills. And, and we need to just continue, even though we are killing them with overburdening them by having comments, etc. You know, we, we, we need to continue doing what works and we need to encourage others to follow suit. Thanks. Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would just like to remind uh, members of the audience, people that are looking at us on Zoom or on Facebook, that you can send in questions on Zoom by using the Q&A function. Uh, we are already receiving quite a few questions and won't be able to answer most of them, but I think they're there for discussion. And those who are watching us on Facebook can ask questions in the comments section. So uh, just as a point I'd like to make as um, a journalist, a science journalist, is that one of the big differences between a science journalist and other types of journalists is that a political journalist can look at a politician uh, in the eye and know just as much about politics as any politician does. But when you're doing science, it's very different because I would have to read, I've read, uh, Himmler, I've read your book and I've read lots of stuff about G, uh, DNA and genes and I'm sure I still don't know one thousandth as much as you do. And it's the same with any other science because the sciences are so niched that it's very different to politics or sport or, or even economics. And this is why I think the science journalist uh, role is very difficult, much more difficult than others. And I think that um, it's up to the scientist, I'm not being impartial here, I realize that, it's up to the scientist to be able to take that into consideration. Um, I, I don't know if you'd like to comment on that. Um, you're absolutely right. I mean, Andrea Lennon, uh, who said past, has posted something in the Q&A. I mean, uh, past has been doing some remarkable work with their bodies in motion. Uh, so, so they've used drama and, and, and dance to get messages across. So it's, it's about using the, the, the multifaceted ways of getting messages across. It doesn't always have to be print media. Uh, and, and I mean, Past also had a fantastic exhibition with DNA and, you know, the story and the journey of humankind. And, and uh, beyond just getting the, the factual content out, every so often as scientists, we need to pause and we need to show what is the relevance of what we do against a societal bandwidth. And I think that is the challenge that we should, we should impose to ourselves is how do we get the value of what we do to intersect with a public issue so that you, you, you can be sympathetic to the issue that you're wanting to talk about. You can, you can put your emotional energy into that aspect, but at the same time, you can punt from wearing your cap as a, a scientist and an academic to bring a little bit of that fact. It's about that balance. How do you balance the, the human component of a dialogue and an issue to bringing the science to the fore? And I think that's a skill most of us need to learn when we communicate the science that we do. Unless you find that, that opportune uh, moments in which you can say, well, let's take, for example, look at this scenario. We, we talked about you know, the taxis and people going in a taxi and being at a higher risk. You know, if you can make it human to something that others have a shared experience over, you're much likely to get your message across and you're much likely to get the buy-in without reducing the value of your scientific vigor. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lamont, you had your hand up. Your, can you unmute your microphone, please? Uh, I just want to agree with um, what you said, Steve, but also what Mandy said about the science and the complexity of the science, but just taking 
when we when we speak about science and, and COVID, um, we almost assume almost a homogenous setup. And yet, if we look at all the media reporting and conversations around COVID, it would come from health, come and medicine, from issues of science, technology, innovation, politics, education, economic. So even the breadth of the uh, input into the COVID conversation or the COVID debate in itself uh, come from a, a, a range uh, of disciplines and a range of interest areas. But in terms of coming back to this question or the situation that has been identified around uh, the lack of uh, science journalists and skilled science journalists and, and science beats as it were in media houses, one of the things we do want to celebrate is the um, a partnership with the um, Conversation Africa, just five years old this uh, year. But what we have found during the COVID time is that uh, remembering that the Conversation as a global platform, and in particular here I'm talking about the uh, Conversation Africa, is this partnership between the scientists and the, the journalistic editorial capacity and the capacity for writing, doing exactly what we've been talking about as a struggle, uh, taking that complex issue, but instilling it under strict editorial journalistic uh, ways of writing to make that same information uh, accessible. And we found with that under the, especially under lockdown, when many of the researchers have been uh, seem to have had more time since the universities have been, especially in the hard lockdown, that a situation has been reversed so that now they have so much copy that is being offered to the platform, so much scientific uh, uh, copy that has been offered, sometimes forgetting that it's still a competitive process and you have to meet certain standards. Um, we which is a total reverse of a situation that we've had, you know, uh, that the Conversation Africa has had prior to uh, the COVID uh, and the lockdown period, where you would almost have to ask scientists, would you like to write on your area of interest? And now we've had scientists uh, coming out and, and wanting, and so we have more copy than we actually have space uh, in, in a daily edition, which is a, which is a great situation to be in. But it also then, once again, reinforces the message of the need for the partnership between the science and the journalistic flair. You know, uh, their byline is uh, scientific rigor, journalistic flair. You need both. And I think it, it is exactly that, that the messaging that keeps coming out, one or the other on their own, unless you are a particular skilled like uh, Professor Slim Karim, uh, Abdul Karim, at communicating the message with confidence, with credibility, and, and increasing visibility. Um, we do need the partnership uh, going forward. Uh, if pose this experience, we are going to have to be able to maintain this, this, this kind of momentum that has been created. I think one of the saddest things that may result, you know, sometimes we have these surges and then after that, okay, there's a lull and then, you know, we, got, we seem to go back to life as, as we knew it uh, pre-COVID. But this momentum that has been created would really be a loss for the science system, especially if we um, fail to find ways to drive that partnership to the next level. Great, that's encouraging. Um, I'm going to change tack a little bit now, and I'm going to read a question sent in by one of the viewers. Uh, in, and the context of this question is, this is Women's Month, and uh, all three of my panelists have the same gender. <laughs> so here it is. Thank you to the panel. According to the data, most of the peer-reviewed scientific articles have been published by male authors than by female authors during the lockdown, and these could have an impact on their long-term career and opportunities. And this is to all, all members of the panel. Are there solutions that you are taking to encourage and support female researchers? 
that was sent in by Marie Corsaga. Yes, uh, I have seen a similar article, a uh, published article, um, looking at some of the data, um, saying that actually we, the, that has been found is that the number of articles uh, by female authors um, actually has reduced. Um, and also um, giving some, uh, an article giving some uh, feedback, uh, whether anecdotal or not, about some of the causes for this in terms of possibly, uh, and this is quoting uh, what, um, what we've seen, what um, I, I read in this particular discussion, uh, quoting the, the different roles that now have to be assumed under, under the lockdown period, under the changed circumstances in, in which we find ourselves, and therefore asking questions, asking the kind of question that you're asking about the supportive roles. I think the supportive roles, I think we must start off by saying, saying that the, the science system is still, especially in the established researcher category where the production of uh, publications, especially if we are using publications as a measure of productivity for this particular, answering this particular question, that the publication is still highest uh, among men in the, in the system uh, and uh, white men in particular. Uh, and so even though you're, you're, you're speaking to a, uh, a drop during this particular period, it, it is still a mismatch uh, pre-COVID and in the traditional uh, publication uh, space. So there are a number of activities uh, or not activities, a number of interventions, programs that are within uh, the NRF space, within the SF space, within the university space to actually uh, focus on supporting, especially in our case, uh, young researchers, young emerging researchers. I think that, that, is, our, that is our challenge uh, as a country, is how to get young emerging researchers, how to support them, um, to get them to the level uh, and to be as productive as established researchers, given the fact that it is not a factory, given the fact that the science, as you've heard, takes time, the development to be an established, internationally recognized researcher also takes time. So, uh, a lot of our particular attention in the programs that we are running or looking uh, to introduce into the system are focusing on uh, taking especially female um, young researchers and supporting them in their journey to becoming productive, um, established and internationally recognized researchers in as short a space as possible, but recognizing that that's still years. It's not. It's not months or you know or, or a, a COVID period or before COVID and, and, and after COVID. That it's a long term commitment to that. Um, the the conditions obviously uh, are this, the issues of work life balance that were mentioned in the article of the roles, patriarchal roles of roles in science that um, assuming still that you produce under. Uh, the kind of conditions where you are assuming what are generally um, seen to be female roles. So um, that that definitely speaks to um, what you are talking about or what the uh, what the participant raised with us, and and we are aware and to say that there are really large conversations going on around the system, uh, continually to look at the support for in this case, the female researcher within science, technology, and innovation. Thank you. We've coming now to the end of our uh, webinar. Uh, I would like to just give the, each of our panelists an opportunity for a few quick uh, concluding remarks. Uh, Professor Sujo. Thank, thank you, Steve. And, and one of the issues that I think we should uh, get across uh, during this discussion is that the science system is experiencing severe budgetary cuts. Um, and again, I mean, we can understand this from a country perspective that we need to, to gather our resources and to apply it into areas 
niche environments where the help is required. So, I mean, our country has put out this 500 billion um, uh, plan uh, fund to, to, to help other initiatives. And that comes at a cost. And, and unfortunately, once again, scientists are vulnerable because uh, we, we have, all of us as entities have experienced these cuts. And I know that through uh, the science system, the SAFT chairs and centers of excellence, et cetera, have similarly been affected. Um, but at the same time, we are meant to, re to, to, to maintain our scientific ethos. We are, we are expected to deliver. So, so these are crossroad ch challenges that we are all experiencing. And, um, you know, Beverly has talked about um, uh, or given a very concise res uh, response about the role of women in science. And again, it's a societal, the base is our societal value system, right? It's been created around a male driven uh, uh, spirit of how we do things. And, and over the years, uh, the gender issues have come to the fore and, and all of us in our various, uh, wearing our various caps, try to bring about that transformation so that a woman have equality in the workspace um, as well. And, and so, so just, just in conclusion, I just want to punch that, that we are living in very difficult times. The challenges are not only uh, um, unilateral, they're multifaceted and they're complex. And, and it doesn't help that we are staring the fa in the face uh, budgetary issues, but at the same time that we have to be relevant and redress the inequalities of the past. So, so all I can say in closing is that, um, you know, opportunities like this for us to have, have uh, an audience to share our insights and to get their responses. And, and that should be a continuum. It shouldn't be just a one day event. We, we are all here in the space of academia where we should be engaging. And it's only if we bring that human solidarity, collaborative uh, ethos uh, out of the ivory towers into the reality of life, only then will we be able to walk a, a common path of, uh, in the direction of making a difference. And so that's, that's my, my heartfelt um, ethos going forward. And I'm sure we all have it within ourselves to do that little bit extra to rise about all the adversity around us so that as a collective, we can make a difference. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Um, Mandy, you had your hand up? Yes, and I wanted to say that when I saw the budgetary cuts, I found myself thinking, what have we learned in this pandemic? I am finding that there's a potential for the fallout from this pandemic to be regressive. And I will return briefly to the thought of women. It's not just women scientists who are finding it impossible to find the time to put together papers at this point. It's all women. I was doing some research for an article the other day. Women are doing double the amount of care work and homework that they did before. Yes, men are doing a little bit more around the world, but a little bit more. It's the women who are doing the homeschooling. It's the women who are doing the housework and to fulfill their other roles as scientists, as journalists, as workers of different kinds. If we don't address that regressive element in this pandemic, we're in trouble. We're going to lose ground. The same thing applies to the budgetary cuts around science in South Africa. Yes, I agree with you, Himmler. We can understand, given the enormous expense that this country is being put to, but I'm afraid that we don't understand that well as a society, and I'm speaking for thousands and thousands of people here when I say, when we see the disgusting loss of public funds to PPE, corruption, and that sort of thing. And what should we be focused on? What should we be learning about? We should be learning that science is pivotal. Science is key. If we don't understand science, this is not just about pandemics. This is one pandemic, 
and we're going to have more pandemics in the future. We have climate change to deal with. We have massive things happening right around the world with climate change that are not being addressed in the media at the moment because there's nobody to pay attention to them. And that's my final point is it is regressive that instead of turning to science journalists and, and using their skills and experience and asking them to mentor people in the newsrooms, to train, that sort of thing, to fund science journalism, that we are not doing that because we are going to need those skills going forward. And finally, to journalists, we have to start thinking. We really have to start putting our heads together and thinking about the future of journalism. I don't mean the future of the media. I mean the future of the skill that is required to interrogate and critically think about what we're doing politically, what we're doing scientifically. What, as Himmler said, what is the purpose of our science? How does it relate to what, what is the happening on the ground? What is its usefulness? Should we be paying for this or should we be paying for that as taxpayers? Should we be advocating for more science in one area or, or, and less in another. That sort of thing can only happen if you have the skill of science journalism, of good journalism, to be a conduit, to be an explainer, to be the, the, the unraveler for, for the person who's got to vote. And I would say to everybody out there, when you next vote, consider what's happening with science. Consider What's being done in science in this country in terms of health, in terms of climate change, energy, water, agriculture, and vote on that basis because those are the things that ultimately are going to matter. Thank you. And Dr. Damans, your concluding remarks? Um, I've been involved in the very, very early conversations about the development of science communication in, in the country and in, in the national system of innovation for as long as I could, too many years um, to give away my age. And despite the budget cuts, which are really, really having effects on the science system um, and, and the way in which we have to think about our future. I, I agree with Mandy, she used the word regression. And on some days when you, you're looking at your budget cuts, that is a word that, that really comes to mind because you don't know beyond this year what, what lays ahead in terms of the numbers. Um, but I must say that for science communication, for the engagement between science and the broader public, including the media. This has to be one of those times in the life cycle of our relationship, uh, science's relationship with uh, the society in which that science is practiced, where you've seen it just rise um, way out of uh, proportion to what we would have imagined at, at this particular time. With that, one of the things I would hope that as a country uh, we would take home from that is this issue of the valuing of science, if I can use the word science and its value is supposedly understood, but actually the valuing of the science and its contributions to, to development its contributions to life, its contributions to our economy. That is what we would hope to see some change in, in how we as a country value the contributions of science. Some people are asking, but what if I'm in maths or what if I'm in a less a visible uh, a discipline to, to, to the pandemic right now? But even in the maths, there's lots of modeling, there's lots of numbers, there's lots of thinking about it. And all the disciplines will benefit from a, just a change in understanding of the value of science and its contribution to, to our lives, to what matters in terms of development. And if we could get that um, political support for the value of science and its contributions to change, then these other things must 
emerge. That changed reaction to the value of science must result in an increased budget. We must put the money where the change will happen. It must result in support for the researcher community uh, in terms of the things uh, that are needed to drive development, young researchers, uh, infrastructure, uh, um, equipment that becomes available. And, and for me, that, that is, a, is a message that needs to go to the highest level, that we are not going to get the kinds of behavioral changes we need if we don't value science differently in terms of its contribution to the differences we are looking for. Um, and I'm hoping, um, it's not, not great, um, it's, it's a flicker right now, uh, I think in terms of the hope, but I think that, I mean, you have a, you have a, a advisory committee, a ministerial advisory, a science advisory committee, that is, you have to believe that you can see the value of the science to this particular uh, pandemic. But we would be wrong to only um, limit it to the pandemic. It's the value of the science to just development, um, to life, to, 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 to society in general, I think is the change we need to see. Um, and, and we would hope that that is coming. It's not here, definitely. I'm, I'm not a firm believer that it's here, but I, I think it, it is the direction in which we need to be uh, driving the conversation. And that wraps up a fascinating discussion on how we will hopefully survive the storm and that scientists, journalists, and science communicators can find a common way. Thank you to panelists, Professor Himla Sujal, Mandy Smallhorn, and Dr. Beverly Damonson. And a big thank you to Professor Janice Limson for curating this online discussion, not forgetting Haley Axford, Freddie Mashati, and Ryan Bruton for putting it all together. And that's it. A goodbye from me, your host, Stephen Lang. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.